Welcome to our closing debate. We have Andrea Steinholz, Executive Secretary at EEA, Marcus Long, CEO at IIOC, Matt Gantley, Chief Executive at UCAS, Ulf Amarström, Director General at SWEDAC, and Christina Haldman, Head of the Accreditation Department and Deputy Director General at SWEDAC in our panel. Welcome. And we will start by uh, showing the results from the Menti poll. We have now processed them and thank you everyone for your contribution. We will start with the first question, which was, in your opinion, what are the challenges for, accredit for accreditation to be relevant in the future? And the results show, as you can see here on the chart, that 10% of you finds competition from other forms of quality assurance. That is the main challenge. 16% finds to apply the accreditation system across borders between countries and regions. 47% to adapt the accreditation system to the market needs. And 25% to implement the use of artificial intelligence and the possibilities that the increasing digitalization enables. Digitalization, yes. And 2% on other options. So, Ulf, what's your comment on this result? Well, to me, that is a happy result if one can uh, label it as that. I think this webinar was all about listening and understanding better the uh, different opinion and the different perspectives, both from markets and from, uh, from the accreditation bodies. So uh, that the big result is adapting, I think, is very much in line with this. And, and obviously, we talked a lot about digitalization and so on. So it seems like uh, we and the audience is uh, in line with our thinking. Matt, uh, do you have any comment uh, to this uh, result from the Manti poll? Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with Ulf. I think um, uh, another way of looking at those results instead of it's a challenge is they are the opportunities. And Marcus and uh, Andreas also have talked that through is you know, we face a very different world uh, going forward. Uh, COVID-19 has been a catalyst in driving forward uh, the adoption of digitization, and we've seen that through the remote assessments. We've got to take that forward as an opportunity with blended assessments, uh, the Internet of Things, cybersecurity, they're all, you know, huge opportunities for us to develop new products. And from an operational perspective as well, embodying using digitization to improve our assessment reports, the way we interact with customers, the way we monitor information from our customers, the way in which we adopt a risk-based approach. I would certainly agree with all of that. And, and the new products and services, um, adapting to the way that the market is changing is absolutely, I see those as, as opportunities just as much as a, a challenge to deliver. Thank you, Matt, for your comments. Christina, what's your take on this uh, result? No, for me, it's not a surprise either, and it's really in line with what we have already listened to. Uh, development is moving very, very rapidly in society. Product life cycles get shorter and shorter. So I think that the tempo in the accreditation process is critical for the future. Uh, one approach could be to increase the use of flexible accreditation, for instance, but we had already mentioned that uh, we have a challenge to explain accreditation and uh, bringing in flexible scope May, doesn't make it easier, but I think it's important. Thank you, Christina. Marcus, uh, do you have any comments from uh, the CAB Association side from this? Yeah, I, I, I love the word that's just been used by Christina there of tempo. I think that's a, a really key one that we need to take out of this. I think over the last few months, uh, the, the tempo at which we've worked and which we've made decisions has increased immeasurably. I've, I've never known the level of activity um, from our community that uh, uh, I've witnessed over the last six months, six, seven months. And I think that's really encouraging. But I think we must take these things that we're hearing here and um, address it with gusto, with tempo, to make sure that we really do take these things forward, that we don't just nod at them again and say, yes, yeah, yeah, that all makes sense. 
um, we need to do things on there. And I think what we find from those different um, ideas that the survey has shown us is that some of them give us requirements, but some also talk about the enablers, about how we can go forward and do these things. So I think we need to make sure that we're embracing all of these things in something that is done both robustly, but with it, with the speed that we have done things in the last few months. Uh, and I think if we can we, if we can continue with that robustness and with that speed, we can do great things that we can be proud of. Thank you, Marcus. Any final uh, comments, conclusion from your side, Andreas, on this uh, answer on the first Mantipole? No, in in general, I I, I agree with with my uh, with my colleagues, but I'm a little bit surprised about the low number of votes for in regard to the competition of other forms of quality assurance and attestation, because uh, some of them are closely linked to even to new technologies. I totally agree that uh, to adapt to market needs is is one key challenge for the future and especially digitalization but uh, if we are looking to digitalization we have some um, uh, systems already in place which are not i will not say in compliance with 765 they are not using at least so far accreditation they have their own systems but uh, here we have to to demonstrate that uh, the professionals for uh, assessing conformity assessment bodies uh, are the national accreditation bodies. That is accreditation, and I'm totally uh, con convinced about that. So I'm a little bit surprised, but in general, I can can totally agree with my uh, with my colleagues. Thank you, Andreas. Anna, the next Manti. Yes, exactly. Our second question was: In your opinion, by 2030. Will the demands for accreditation in present accreditation areas increase, decrease, or be unchanged? And as you can see in the chart, 45% thinks it will increase with up to 50%, 9% believes in a decrease, and 47% believes in a steady state. And we will actually move to our third question as we are a little bit short of time here. So we'll present the results from our third question. And that was, in your opinion, where do you see a possibility for accreditation to develop and increase its growth within the next 10 years? And as you see from the chart, 4% believes this is in present areas, 31% in regulated areas, 4% believes in private sectors, and 60% believes in sectors that are not using accreditation today. So these were the results from the Menti poll, and thank you again for uh, contributing to that, everyone in the audience. Uh, if we now broaden the perspective and, and leave the poll aside for a, a moment, uh, and Ulf, uh, if you look at the bigger picture, where do you find accreditation and the value of accreditation stands today? Which is Svedak's view on this? Well, thank you. I've been uh, listening all afternoon and uh, there's really a lot to learn from uh, listening to all the different perspectives. Uh, I believe that there is a pretty harmonized view in many ways on, on these issues that uh, accreditation is fundamentally about trust and we need to both protect that trust uh, and also to make sure that we are agile in uh, our continuous development. Uh, we, we all agree, and I think that very much also from a Swedish perspective, that we have a huge role in uh, educating, informing, making known uh, what we stand for. And it will be especially or increasingly challenging in a time with uh, fast changes. And um, I agree to what I think also everyone has um, in a way said, that the pandemic is changing us forever. There will be a new balance in on-site and remote assessments. Uh, it will affect peer reviews, and um, uh, this is a key role to reform. 
And I think also not least uh, interesting, which I will talk with my ministry about as quickly as possible, is Acredia's view on using accreditation within the EU Recovery Fund. I think that was a very interesting idea. Uh, well, when it comes to um, my own thoughts, in addition to this, I think that the use of data is a very key thing where we are within Swedak uh, starting to uh, work on using the, the data we have historically and uh, are collecting all the time uh, so that it can be more helpful to us that we learn from it. And that's, of course, risk management is an obvious part. Um, I also think that uh, we need more cooperation between the accreditation bodies. I think that we are, in a way, inventing the wheel ourselves, everyone, uh, in an unnecessary fashion. We have mostly, as far as I know anyway, and we definitely have it, our own IT systems, and we have our own training and so on, on the same standards. And there I think we could... Uh, we could cooperate more to the benefit of, uh, of the system and uh, customers. I agree, of course, with uh, Christina on uh, the need to keep tempo. Uh, I think we need more involvement by the uh, senior management in, in a continuous way. We now pretty much focus on, on uh, general assemblies and so on, but I think we collectively need to be be more continuously um, involved and the in the European case of course the um, the dialogue with the Commission is critical on the future role and um, and uh, acting of the or working of the of the system uh, so I think very encouraged that uh, we seem to have pretty harmonized opinions it's all about doing it and i think a little bit maybe marcus summarized it in that we need to protect and improve i think that could be the two words maybe summarizing our way forward as well protect and improve great thank you thank you Ulf. Uh, matt gantley how well does this reflect yuka's view on what has been discussed about the future today yeah, um, I think we're looking at the data itself. I think um, maybe the my, my reflection would be that the, the the positive upside in terms of growth of, of up to fifty percent growth. I I don't, I don't necessarily see that as um, as as much as where it's going to be. I think it's probably uh, too positive. I think uh, generally the market is quite mature, and so therefore I, I think uh, you know up to ten percent growth overall is is probably what we would expect. Um, what I would also suggest is that uh, the, the balance between what is regulated uh, or the regulatory driver of 31% and the non-accredited is, is probably about right. I think um, Andreas uh, in his presentation said there's around about just over 100 um, uh, schemes within uh, Europe that are connected to uh, original European legislation and that just shows the, the importance of the connection between the, the work of the European Union and uh, accreditation. Um, but I think the, the, the overall uh, voluntary non uh, market is actually a, a major part of the growth in the future. Um, reflecting on all the other things that uh, we've we've seen and we've heard uh, over the last uh, the day, I think I very much uh, reflect mirror what um, Ulf has said. Our own priorities at UCAS, as you know, one of the largest uh, accreditation bodies in Europe, is is very much the same as as you know uh, Marcus has described and Andreas has described and Ulf has described. Is that you know our, one of our first priorities is ensuring we have strong international collaboration at a European level and an international level. Um, quality is, is absolutely critical to delivering our services and that, that's why I put customer service right at the very front of, of the way that we deliver that. Um, the way in which we explain accreditation, I think Ulf is correct again in there, in, terms, in order to deliver growth uh, in regulated and unregulated areas, we need to communicate much better the, the value of accreditation and use data like uh, Accredia have presented us with, as with today to open up minds to the opportunity and the flexibility of accreditation into new and emerging areas. 
we also need to use that technology uh, ourselves. Um, and you know, UCAS, we're investing very much in our ERP system, our portal, our assessment reporting, as well as the way in which we interact with our customers and using data, much more ongoing evaluation of um, of their performance in order in order to drive a, a risk based uh, approach. Um, but underlying all of that, um, you know, Mark has picked up on many of these points here, is that you know we need a culture, not just at UCAS, but across uh, accreditation that is constructive, collaborative, uh, outward looking, and very much consistent in the way that it works. I think you know there's many structural things that we need to do, uh, lots of hard work and engagement, but we need to also think about the, uh, the cultural side as well. Thank you, Matt. Great, thank you. And um, I turn to Christina now. From your standpoint, what what do you what's your reflection on all this? Yeah, we have discussed and heard uh, reflections about uh, opportunities and also challenges. And some of the challenges uh, that I do see and which are correlated to each other are availability of competence and the cost for accreditation. There is a positive trend that accreditation is used to ensure reliability and trust in a wide range of areas. Um, that is a very positive signal uh, that there is confidence in the accreditation system. Uh, it is, however, difficult to anticipate the market need in some cases, as Matt has uh, told us about, and the cost per accreditation can become very high if there are only a few actors interested. And in small, very niche areas, uh, it also becomes difficult to ensure availability of core competence. Uh, and how is the availability of niche technical competence uh, in the future? I do not think it will be easier. Uh, there is a trend uh, with uh, the gig economy that might work in our favor, that working on a global market will be more common. The trend could, however, was result that more people are changing jobs more quickly and that the availability of experts with long experience will, uh, in a particular field, they will become even rare. And if competence is limited in availability, that usually means that it drives costs. Uh, and it's important, I think, to prevent uh, that the system in, in general, in, in the opinion of legislators and also on market, get the re reputation of being too costly. So I think that we need together, as we have done today, share experience and learn from each other to say no to some areas and also to focus together on promote the role of technical experts to increase the popularity of working with the accreditation bodies. Uh, and today many of us are, uh, due to the pandemic, uh, adapting our way of working as we have already discussed. And uh, the technology are in many cases very good, but in some cases not efficient. But to continue to develop it together I think is very important. Thank you, Christina. Over to Marcus Long, how does this reflect the uh, IOC's view on the, the future? I think there are a couple of things from what people have, have talked about today. I think, first of all, the demand as much as anything is up to us. Uh, if we're bold and if we can do the right things, uh, then we can grow as much as we want. But actually, I think there's a couple of key things we need in place to do that. I think the word cooperation is a massively important word here. Um, and sometimes we do spend too much time looking at the operational issues and not actually thinking about the future and strategy. And maybe one of the things that we do need to do is actually to put together some kind of foresight group within the conformity assessment community to actually bring together um, the, the great and the good and the wise not just from our industry, but from outside our industry to actually say what is going to be important in the future. And we do need to prioritize them. We do. We can't back every single horse. We can't we can't go with everything that everybody wants us to do. So let's maybe try and bring those people together and start thinking about what we should be doing. And as has been said, we have limited resources in this industry and there's an awful lot of repetition. There's still repetition. 
We have a global system. We have a fabulous global system. Let's make sure we use that global system and not waste our limited resources, efforts and energy by all doing things individually, where actually we can bring people together uh, and produce a much better um, and a more coordinated approach that will deliver more things for more people in the future. And we always say it, and we've said it numerous times today, communication and education is still such a huge part of that. Um, and, I, and I fundamentally believe that we still play too much lip service to that. We talk about always wanting it, but we never really put our money where our mouth is and actually say, let's let's really come out with some good arguments. Let's really come out with some good information to help people. So I think the future is in our hands. I think we, we can do great things. We can go forward very positively, um, but I think we do need to work better together to do that. And the more we can do that, the more we can achieve for ourselves, but most importantly, for our customers and our stakeholders. Thank you, Marcus. And Andreas Steinhorst, what is your view on all this? I can finally only agree with it was uh, the previous speaker has already said, but perhaps uh, let me say, yes, I, I think we, 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 I would not say we have to protect and to improve. I would say that uh, we have to continue with our good job in the existing uh, sectors and from my point of view, especially in the regulated uh, sector. Here we have already demonstrated that accreditation by the national accreditation body is the best tool to demonstrate competence of conformity assessment bodies. But on the other hand, of course, we have also to look to the to the new sectors with the new challenges and, and one example was already mentioned the uh, um, artificial uh, intelligence uh, uh, applications, uh, where we need uh, new competencies, new expertise, and uh, that is uh, where I totally agree with my my colleagues, where we have to cooperate. So it will be much easier to to be prepared if we do it together instead of. Uh, uh, everybody alone. So EA, we will take it on board and we will take it uh, seriously. It was also mentioned by Christina that we have those small areas even these days where some uh, accreditation bodies have only one or two accredited conformity assessment bodies. And, and here it would be perhaps more efficient uh, to, to, to cooperate uh, uh, with NEA, with other national accreditation bodies, uh, it could be more efficient uh, uh, for for everybody involved. So that is also where where we have to to look at, especially uh, in regard to to uh, to to future sectors. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you, Andreas. We are getting closer to the end here, so we just have a final uh, closing question. So after listening today, what have you found most interesting, and how will you take take action? In a few words, I will hear from you. I would like to hear from you. Matt, would you like to start? Gosh, yeah, I, I think uh, Peter might have said it already. Uh, it's been a very useful uh, uh, event for us. It's uh, just, I think if, if anything, it's just reaffirmed the, the importance of collaboration, as everyone said, and for, especially in Europe, for accreditation bodies to work together to ensure that we deliver the very highest level of uh, accreditation for regulators right across the uh, European continent and also an industry uh, and ensuring that we provide a, an excellent service for our conformity assessment bodies. So I think for me, it's uh, just reaffirmed the importance of working closely together. Uh, both UCAS and SWEDAC have a very strong relationship. And for me, that's uh, something we all, we're very much committed to working on in the, in the future. Thank you very much, Matt Gantley from UCAS. I will ask Marcus Long from IIOC the same question. What is your main takeaway from, uh, from this uh, afternoon and how will you take action moving forward, please? Um, I think the thing that I've learned is that it's very encouraging that we know the answers. We know an awful lot of the answers and what we must do we don't know all the answers, but we know where to go and get those answers. So I think that's the key thing that I've taken out of this is that there's a, a great awareness of what we need to do. Um, what's the action out of that? Oh, we've got to do it. 
it really is that simple. We've got to we've got to do what we've heard about today and what we've all talked about. Let's stop talking about it and let's make sure we get out there and do it. Great, thanks. Thank you, Marcus. I put the same question to Andrea Steinhaus. What have you found most interesting and how will you take action tomorrow? <laughs> Uh, I found everything very interesting. So thank you for the uh, for the webinar. But uh, for me, it 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 uh, is really key. It's a co collaboration b between uh, all the parties invo uh, involved. Not only between the national accreditation bodies, also with with uh, uh, the conformity assessment bodies, with the uh, industry, with the regulators. Uh, and to, to listen what uh, about their needs, especially in regard to to uh, uh, future um, developments. So um, we will take that on board, of course, in uh, our own uh, EA work, in our EA strategy. Some of those uh, issues are, are already uh, covered in the EA strategy 2025 but we will review what is uh, still missing and what we have to cover uh, in the next strategy, perhaps in the strategy 2030. Great, thank you so much, Andreas Steinhorst from EA. I will now turn to Kristina Hallman from Sverak and ask you the same question. What is your main takeaway and how will you take action tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, uh, dialogue and sharing experience is vital for development. That is very obvious. And for me, to hearing the strength of getting figures on the facts, for instance, Stefan's and also the Acredia lecture, is very inspiring. You see in communication, you get the strength. Right? So continue with uh, that kind of dialogue is what I'm going to do. Yes, great. Thank you. Thank you. Some final remarks from you, Ulf, most interesting and how you will take action. Well, I think the speed and the scope of developments which we need to ensure that we uh, develop for, I think, is, uh, is my main takeaway. Cooperation, I will do my very best to, uh, to increase that and, and try to make sure that we uh, develop together with the, with the other NABs. But also uh, the feeling of the very fundamental role of assurance and giving stability to society that we also need to try to protect through the changes. Great. So thank you all speakers. Thank you everyone in the room for great presentations. Um, and thank you everyone listening in from links all around the world. Thank you for your contribution. We have investigated many aspects of the value of accreditation. We hope we have given you all some food for thought. Now let's take on the future. Thank you all.